Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming to our session. I'm Praveen Yalagandula, and mm -hmm. with me I have uh, Gaurav Rastogi, my colleague from Avi Networks. Hi. Today we are going to talk about uh, continuous delivery of cloud applications, uh, blue-green and canary deployments. So here are a couple of quotes from well-regarded folks in the CICD communities. Martin Fowler says that continuous delivery is a software development discipline where you build your software so that it can be released to production at any time. And Jez Hubble says that the goal for continuous delivery, or the goal for making deployments of whatever kind of system that you have is to make it predictable and a routine affair so that you can perform it at demand at any time. So continuous delivery involves automation and integration of all stages of your software development, all the way from developing your code, testing, to the final release. So you want to have a predictable, reliable, fast, and better quality continuous delivery process. And it has lots of benefits, right? So it uh, results in better organizations because software developers uh, can, it empowers them to be able to develop the software and have this rigorous process where they can develop the software and release and uh, be ready to see the, get the feedback on how well their software is right away without needing to wait for really long times where they develop something today and after six months starts to get bug reports about what you have developed. And for the business perspective, business organizations like the PMs and sales, they love it because they can do lots of features. They release the features to customers at a very short time. And operations definitely feel better because now you have better quality software and you have less downtime and less risk. And overall, this process also increases your security because you have a faster way to patch your applications, cloud applications, and hence reduce threats. In the old school way of doing uh, your process or de deployment of applications, the process is pretty siloed, right? Like you have the developers doing the uh, software development, doing the testing, building, and doing that cycle in each component or the service that they own. And then you have the release managers putting them these together, doing an integration testing and generating a release candidate. And finally, you have the operators that are deploying and upgrading and the monitoring and rolling back. These, each of these individual silos themselves have like several month uh, cycles. So the overall feedback in the system is pretty elongated. In contrast, continuous delivery as a process is about uh, having all this in one single cycle. So you have develop, fix, build, test, release, deploy, everything automated and going through in a cycle and have fallback at any point and have this quick feedback that makes it a uh, lot of difference. And the key to be able to get this is to have automation for every piece in this cycle. And uh, another big challenge is to, you do want to have zero downtime for any of these deployment uh, cycles, like in the deploy process. Otherwise, you will not be able to, like, that's one of the big things that people don't do upgrades is that you have to always schedule for a downtime. But if you have a process where you don't have any downtime for bringing up your next deployment, then overall you can do more of those deployments. And that's where blue-green and canary deployment strategies come into picture. So blue-green is uh, one strategy where you use two identical versions of, uh, uh, two, sorry, two uh, deployments of your application, each with different versions. So typically, blue refers to the current, and green refers to the new version that you're installing. And as part of uh, deployment, you switch your sessions to your new version, green version, and make sure that the validations are going through. And if everything is good, you basically uh, move to green, and uh, you uh, look at your blue, keep it for some time, or destroy it, or analyze it. And if validation fails, then you always roll back and then use your green deployment for debugging what happened. 
Now, this is one deployment strategy, and the other deployment strategy that's uh, even more powerful is uh, Canary. In Canary, you divert a percentage, a small fraction of traffic or a certain percentage of your traffic to your second version, new version, and you keep testing that. And if the validation fails, you basically simply start scaling back the traffic back to your old deployment. And as you're getting more comfortable, you keep moving the traffic, and eventually you move all your traffic to your new version and just uh, discard the old version. The, one of the interesting things about the scannery deployment is that in contrast to blue-green, where you are essentially creating two identical setups, that means you need to have 2x times resources at the time of deployment. In case of Canary, you can kind of do it more elastically. So your resources are not like 2x, maybe like some 1.1x or 1.2x. And uh, by having like an auto-scaling system set up, you can naturally grow and uh, ramp down on each of those versions. But this requires that your applications be able to uh, handle uh, this kind of elastic uh, scale and elastic moving of one version to another version. To quickly talk about the validation step, like once you move the traffic, then you need to talk about like how do you validate once you have these two versions in place. You need to decide on what's your methodology going to be for validation. So that includes like figuring out how, what kind of traffic that you want to send, how do you increase the traffic, how long uh, you keep the traffic going at a certain fraction, and what kind of traffic will you use, and so on. So this one depends entirely on the application, and you have to pick the right kind of model for validating your, uh, validating your uh, application. And metrics is very important in there to figure out like whether the new version is doing well and as expected. And so you have to you have like bunch of different kinds of metrics depending on the type of the application, all the way from response time, number of open connections, quality of requests, and so on and so on. One of the things about uh, metrics is that you want to pick metrics such that they kind of are scalable. Like if you're doing a canary deployment and you have 90% and 10%, 10% of your traffic going to the new version, you don't want to exactly compare it to how your old version is, but kind of scale it down. So you need to have your metrics scaled out, scaled to the right factors. And the other thing is you want to have full auditing on the system as you do this uh, deployment so that you get to see uh, how the uh, deployment, how this migration is going on, and uh, so that you can use it for both when you need to, when you roll back, figuring out what happened, and so on. Now, I, we said that like you want to have these two different versions. One of the big challenges there is how do you have these versions in place and at the same time be manage this traffic across to these two different versions. So you, the problem is how do you orchestrate this traffic switching, either in blue, green, or canary between these two different versions. And you can do it in a variety of ways, all the way starting from your end client that is using the application to the, uh, all the way on the other side, having in your L3, L2 network, your load balancer taking care of it. So let me quickly go through these different options. So in client application based, uh, say you have version one and you come up with version two, and maybe you push a patch to your applications to start using version two. Or maybe you have a catalog where you post which specific set of uh, your clients will access version two and so on. That's one approach, but it's not a very generic solution. Uh, it's not very flexible and uh, it depends heavily on, the, on your application. The other common approach, the other kind of thing that you most people do is DNS-based uh, routing, where you have your version one and you basically do your version two and replace your DNS with your new IP address. And uh, that way these uh, clients get uh, routed to the new version. Again, this has certain limitations, like uh, many times you have DNS caching going on at different uh, levels of your DNS resolution. And also for kind of canary deployments, the granularity at which you can do this kind of switching becomes very coarse because you can probably put new uh, servers, but that 
at the server level is the granularity at which you can switch the traffic. BGP-based routing is as another thing. Uh, so as you go closer and closer to the deployment of your application, so you have upstream router, and some way your applications talk to your BGP router and start like advertising the new version, advertise the new route so that the traffic goes to that, while the older version withdraws the route. Now again, this one has the issue that existing one existing sessions will get disrupted because now you are switching all your sessions to the new version, and also it's similar to DNS, you have coarse granularity on your Canary deployments. In contrast to all those, like doing load balancer based um, deployments gives quite a bit of benefits because typically load balancers have like very flexible APIs on how well you can control how you do your traffic dispersing across different versions. And this fine-grained control on traffic engineering is a key advantage to the load balancer. And we will go into the details of uh, this load balancer based deployments. So to quickly tell about uh, the load balancer, the, uh, so Avi Networks, we build a software-based load balancer, and it has web application firewall, service mesh, and built-in analytics. And we have been uh, in use at, been vetted by several big companies and been in use for six plus years and has a very uh, diverse set of uh, Full features, uh, full featured load balancer. Now, to go on to the architecture on the how it works. So it's a built like a SDN-like architecture. So we have separated out the control plane and data plane, and the control plane spins up the data plane instances, the service engine virtual machines, uh, as many as needed on demand. So there is the auto scale at the level of load balancer too, so that it can do the traffic um, as needed. And these service engines are virtual machines or containers or bare metals. They can be deployed in different form factors across your OpenStack, vCenter, AWS, Azure, different clouds, all multi-cloud solution from a single point uh, control. So it's like a true SDN kind of solution applied to uh, your L7 services. And we have a lot of intelligence built into it. One of the topics we are covering today is about uh, analytics-driven continuous delivery. All that intelligence is built into the, con into the control plane so that it continuously monitors the entire system and makes certain decisions based on what it is measuring. And we have full-fledged automation, so we have 100% RESTful API-driven. So if you can do Ansible-based or Terraform-based automations against the control plane, and you can deploy, do your continuous delivery. Now, the way the resource model works is that you have a virtual service that's on the left-hand side, and then you have pool groups. A pool group is associated with a virtual service that defines What's your sets of servers that you have that are, uh, that are uh, hosting your application? So on the right-hand side, you have two pools. One is like green pool, and the other is a blue pool. And we have these ratios that you can assign to each of the pools to determine whether you're doing a blue-green, or you can do a canary deployment to slowly change the traffic from one pool to another pool by basically changing the ratios. And uh, uh, we, Gaurav is going to take on from here to show on more demo of how we are doing this analytics-driven canary deployment. Um, why don't you take from here? Sure. Uh, thanks, Praveen. Uh, so one of the tough problems we have always faced is uh, live production, right? Like no one wants to touch it, and uh, everyone is scared of and runs into hiccups with when, when they change things. So uh, with, with this solution or, or any load balancing based solution, the WIPs uh, kind of don't change here, uh, as you see on the left-hand side. But, but then uh, uh, as we change the ratios, of traffic going to different versions of your applications. And this is really pool of applications, um, uh, application instances. Uh, you, you also want to essentially uh, 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 control how the switch 
uh, happens, right? So like some application you would want to just uh, test with like five minutes of window, everything looks fine, you want to switch over and uh, uh, move on. Uh, but for certain applications, you may want to run for like a days uh, and uh, uh, give small loads, 5%, 10%, 20%, and then keep going on. So that's kind of very important. How do you ramp up your traffic uh, to the new version of the uh, software? Uh, the other thing Praveen talked about, pass-fail uh, rules, uh, that's uh, kind of integral to the load balancing. The reason we have a lot of analytics uh, uh, in the load balancing layer is one, to show nice graphs, uh, I'll be honest, but the other is to actually take that information and then circle back into the decisions uh, of deployment. So we can take the metrics and load balancer can check that, yeah, applications is not exhibiting any um, errors or um, uh, it is meeting its SLAs, the latencies are all good, and then it will keep on moving the deployment forward to the new version. And uh, uh, based on uh, the uh, thing, uh, policies, it can automatically roll back or it could completely terminate connections to the previous one or just bring in the new version to a certain load and, and keep it there. Uh, there is also like webhook integrations to uh, integrate with external validations if required. So let me get into the demo of Avi. So, um, so, so the first demo I'm going to show uh, is a live switch from a blue to green. And uh, again, the emphasis is on the automation uh, as well as uh, as an admin, you want to know exactly what is going on because you don't want too much magic. You want to, you want to see predictability and you can observe the results going on. So let me go to... So, uh, so uh, let me just. So this is uh, actually what, what I'm going to demo is uh, this is uh, Avi controller, and uh, here you can see uh, when you, when you log in, uh, you get, you have a one place to look at all the virtual services. Uh, it's kind of uh, yeah. So these are, this is all the list of virtual services, and it's a multi-tenant system. Let me just turn around a little bit so I can see both sides. Yeah. So it's a, it's a multi-tenant system where. Uh, you can uh, just uh, uh, pick a tenant, and right now we can, I'm going to show a demo of a container environment uh, with Kubernetes. What you're seeing is actually a VMware, and, and another is an OpenStack. So I go to my tenant, uh, OpenShift tenant, and I can see all my applications there. Now, how, how is this working, right? Uh, so. This is my OpenShift, uh, a simple deployment for the demo I have with a one node setup. And I have a d default namespace here. And inside the default namespace, I have uh, a couple of applications configured. Uh, so these applications uh, in the services, uh, I have a green service and a blue service. So if I click on the green service, it's a very simple uh, uh, application with service port on TCP HTTP and port 80. And it has a selector published as uh, AVI CI CD service green. And similarly, uh, I have the one which is in, in running right now is the blue one. And this blue one is tied to the router in Kubernetes, if you're familiar with it. Uh, so if I go here in the routes, uh, of ECI CD. This is a, a kind of a router configured for ingress, not salt uh, connection, and very simple application with HTTP and AD for, for the demo. And here you can see that uh, the default is uh, set up as blue, and it is getting 100% of the traffic. And my green, which has already gone through the full CI pipeline, build, integration test, unit test, Everything is ready. Now you are at the last but very critical stage of bringing it into the production, and and it is ready ready for that. Now, once a, a application is configured here, 
what happens is uh, uh, on Avi side, we, uh, it is configured with a cloud, uh, so infrastructure cloud. So there are, there's an OpenShift cloud configured here. And if I go to the edit of it, let me go to the admin account. Yeah, so, so yeah, the way it works is the OpenShift, uh, 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 the microload balancers are set up as a pod, and those pods are visible to Avi controller because they are set up with a service account, and that service account is registered onto uh, Avi controller. And using that service account, uh, um, Avi essentially becomes the, uh, micro, uh, the default proxy for all the containers, uh, container apps. And uh, uh, the service engines are actually deployed as a pod themselves. And uh, as the traffic uh, comes in, or, or like the service webs are created, the route in OpenShift is created, service engine essentially uh, owns that web and uh, configures the underlying container, container networking such that it can receive all the traffic and then forward all the uh, requests. Now, the question is like, what, why would you do that, right? Like, and, and the real re reason is with service engines um, or Ravi solution, you're getting the, like the VAP functionality, security, uh, advanced load balancing, uh, ACLs, all these functionalities um, that, that is available uh, in the container environment. So I'll go back to my tenant, go to my application. Uh, here, you would see that, um, yeah, so this RVCI CD is actually uh, um, automatically learned from the OpenShift environment. Uh, it, the, 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 the picture is pretty much what we had shown before, which is uh, the virtual services of VCI CD, and it takes in the route name. And there are two pools configured in it. One is uh, the default blue, which, which is here, and then the green, which is this one. And each of these have two containers. So the arrows are not showing up here in the projector, but it kind of shows which containers belong to uh, which one. So as an admin, you could all kind of go in into the application and see, oh yeah, uh, whether application everything is fine or not. So right now, it, you can see the transactions going through. There's about 10 megabits uh, of uh, traffic, open connections. So this is what is incoming. All the clients, live traffic is incoming. And if I go to my uh, uh, pool, um, here I can see uh, pretty much everything is going to one pool right now. And I go to my green pool. There's nothing. There's absolutely no data because there's no, uh, nothing going on. So let me go ahead and now uh, go and change uh, the routing uh, and trigger a blue-green. Now, this is a manual way of doing it, where uh, in Kubernetes, uh, you can actually post an API call and change the weights, and it's going to trigger blue-green. Uh, what I'm doing is manual, but it can be done via Terraform, Ansible, uh, anything, uh, any uh, tooling of your choice. And then I'm going to kind of show the next case of doing it fully automated. So I'm going to move. Uh, green from 0 to 100, uh, and blue becomes uh, uh, 0. And it's going to trigger an update, uh, and RV is going to pick it up. And let's see. On the green side, let's give it. So, so first, I think uh, this event happened where it picked up the ratio change. And once the ratio change is done, uh, we should see uh, the traffic actually getting switched over. Um, if we go to the virtual server side, while this whole thing is going on, you are not going to see any change in the traffic. Uh, all the clients are still coming in. All the transactions are still kind of going through. Uh, as is, no, no issues, you see no errors happening. So in real time, you are switching the traffic. Now let me go back to the green pool. Uh, 
and you can see that it has started receiving traffic now. And uh, it is kind of ramping up here. And we go back to the blue pool. Um, and uh, sorry, it's kind of, yeah. Uh, you, you can see that there's no more traffic here. So right here, you can like do all your validations on top of it. And um, as an admin, you can actually see that there are no issues going on and, and really go ahead and uh, confirm the change. Uh, one more thing that happens here is uh, even though it's a container environment, a lot of these containers are ephemeral, uh, you have full visibility into what is going on. So if I can go into one of the containers and get uh, uh, stats and analytics on each of them, like this is what each container's uh, uh, metrics are. So uh, if there are any scheduling issues or if there are any issues uh, in the host, uh, they would pop up here. So. Uh, given like open connections, all this information is right here. Uh, so let me go to um, yeah. Actually, yeah, it should also should have shown the memory. I'm surprised it's not pulling up here. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let me uh, go and uh, show the next one, which is um, the. Uh, uh, canary deployment. So, so here was an example where we, we set up everything with uh, 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 like uh, the, the load balancer was set up with two pools, two versions of the application, and then the admin via API or um, through the UI in the OpenShift was able to trigger a blue-green deployment. Uh, but uh, this whole thing can actually be set up uh, inside Avi uh, using the pool group deployment policy. So uh, let me first show uh, uh, the, the other app inside the OpenShift. Shift. Uh, so we go to the application, services, and here I have two versions of the app, uh, two, two services actually, and they are kind of registered to this AV uh, Canary route, routing. This becomes uh, uh, a virtual service in AV platform. Uh, so if you go to the controller, this is the virtual service. And uh, the, the, the way to trigger um, the Canary would be the, those two pools become a pool group in uh, AV. And in this pool group, I have a open shift uh, deployment, uh, canary deployment policy configured. If you go inside this policy, you can see that uh, all the things we talked about that you want to have validation metrics. So there are two validation metrics set up here which says that the uh, percentage response errors should be less than the previous version. And at the same time, it should be less than 10%, for example. I could have put 1% as well. Uh, in addition, uh, it, it is looking at Abdex R. So Abdex R is a, is a meta metric which looks at the quality of transactions. So it ranks all the transactions between the ones which are meeting SLAs and one which are not. And it looks at the ratio. So if all transactions are meeting SLAs, the number should be 100. So right now it is set up as it should be as good as the previous version. And at the same time, it should be more than uh, a 90 as a score. Uh, in addition, you can see these two settings, which is saying, uh, what is the evaluation duration for this whole deployment? So at every round, it is sending a fraction of the traffic. And that fraction is determined by this number here. Uh, and it would run it for an evaluation duration. Once that evaluation duration is done, it is going to uh, check all the metrics to see everything is fine. And if it is fine, it will promote it to the next level. And it will keep going uh, that way. And target ratio essentially determines that from the previous uh, 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 ratio uh, the version 1 had. Uh, and when you bring in the new version, which is version 2, what is the target ratio of traffic the version 2 should go? And RV load balancer will, will shift that much. So, so it kind of caters to a lot of deployments. Like uh, for certain apps, admins have just put ratio to be 100 for very critical apps. Sometimes they have said, oh, I want to stop and see everything at 10, and then let the automation go from 10 to 100, for example. So once, once this, this is set, 
uh, and uh, the, the canary deployment essentially gets triggered if the deployment state for any pool is set to uh, evaluation in progress. So uh, it takes uh, kind of the whole run. This one, this configuration is set up to incrementally go by 10%, and it runs uh, each evaluation window is 50, uh, five minutes, so it kind of takes the whole, whole thing as one hour. So I had it already go through uh, earlier in the day, and I'll just show you how this looks like. So uh, this is the cannery upgrade, yes. Uh, let me move, zoom out to six hours. And here you can see that uh, kind of the open connections stayed uh, pretty flat. My, my script had dropped uh, in between, and uh, it is actually showing the UTC time. I don't know, it's the normal time. So my script had gone down, uh, so you don't see anything here. This is where all the deployments were going on. So if I click here, you would see that deployment updates happen. So first deployment update happened at, at uh, time 10.38, and then for every five minutes, it would keep updating it, uh, the ratios. So if, I, if you see here, the ratio was updated to 11, and then the ratio was uh, kind of updated to us. So I have it all listed out here. Let me show. So you can see how at every stage it, it kind of kept bumping up the ratios and you have a full audit trail of what happened uh, as the traffic was being uh, switched. Now you would want to know like what happened at each stage, right? So at each stage it also captures what was the, uh, the criteria, the pass-fail criteria and what were the results in those. So for every metric it will uh, record what was the value of that metric and uh, also what was the result. And finally, at the end, uh, it will be successful and uh, the event kind of captures what was the previous uh, pool in service uh, and uh, what is the new pool in service, what were the final results, uh, all, all that is captured as an event. Now this event can be used to trigger other notifications. You can set it up with Slack, you can set it up for email, all that. Uh, uh, can, can be done for, on a per customer basis. And I, I go to the pool group, uh, the final state for this pool uh, kind of shows one version, which is version two, is in service, and the other one is uh, on out of service. And, and then I, I, I'd also like to show, um, yeah, um, this is kind of uh, on the VNC. Uh, you can see like how this this pool is the uh, default uh, pool, uh, the version one pool, and this was kind of holding the traffic all the way, and then it finally kind of died down around 10, 10, 40 or so, and this is the other pool, which you can see it started ramping up traffic from 9.30 all the way, and it kind of goes till 11 o'clock, and then the whole deployment was switched over from the one uh, uh, version of the application to the other version of the application. Um, so, um, yeah, let me go back to my slides. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, so um, with that, uh, I want to also present the case study, which one of our customers actually uh, used Avi to uh, do the blue-green deployments and, and canary deployments in their production, and what were the lessons learned from them uh, in general around the uh, continuous delivery. Uh, so the, the case study is from a, a leading provider of research uh, databases and information, and we have presented this case studies uh, pre previously too, uh, so if you want to look, at, look up more details. Uh, the goal of, uh, like, when, our, when they were looking at the continuous delivery as a problem or as a goal, uh, these were really their main issues. Uh, their deployments were very costly. It was very high risk environment. Uh, large set of changes would, would be pushed in together and they would always have these break, uh, like build breaks or, or issues. Um, e even their environments were very inconsistent. Uh, they had uh, very unstable uh, development environments and they, the production usually would get a lot of care and there would be no issues in production and the development would be all mess because everyone is using different patches and different things. 
uh, and, and what issues would show up in development wouldn't show up in production, and a lot of times what would not show up in development will actually show up in production. So it, it, it essentially resulted in uh, basically two to three releases per year for them, and uh, this would result in a lot of changes getting bashed together and, and cause instability in the release. Uh, I'm, I'm sure this is this is a very common story, and we have seen it in uh, several uh, customers' environments and in our own development as well. And we we could really empathize with that. Uh, and th th this problem conflagrates when uh, the scale is very high. Like in this particular case, more than 300 services across uh, 8,000 systems. Um, uh, so so. What they, the way they were able to uh, get to continuous delivery was they started with what they call automation factory. And the goal of the automation factory was to have everything automated inside it. So obviously, they had a lot of systems, and they couldn't just transition everything in one go. They started with a small set of application as a wall garden where everything was 100%. And, and you, there is a lot of emphasis from them uh, around 100% because even if there is one step which is manual, for example, or you need to go change a config file or touch a file, that breaks the whole thing. So you really have to be able to go from a start to finish, like from a code check into the delivery uh, in 100% automated way, and that's when uh, everything works. And finally, uh, they were able to do uh, releases in like two weeks' time, and and uh, pretty pretty impressive uh, uh, pipeline. Um, uh, one of the things they uh, also emphasize is uh, you got to have a stable environment. And in order to get to the stable environment, we'll see that it also needs to become uh, uh, like an infrastructure as a code and very, very much uh, on the, the uh, goals of OpenStack. So, uh, so they, they started kind of writing down the, um, um, the requirements and some of the things they uh, th th which I believe uh, applies across the board is uh, all deployments must be based off purpose-built uh, automated image template. It's very important. The seed of the image or the, from where the automation kicks off needs to be very predictable and built automatically. Uh, testing must be very uh, automated. Validation has to be automated. Like you don't want to be like, oh, somebody gets a report and then does an approval, and that that's, that's, that doesn't scale very well. Um, and uh, 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 one very crucial thing is uh, that you there will be multiple systems, and when you are trying and troubleshooting those systems, uh, you want. The, the information to flow into commonplace, uh, like, like log classify the session before it, or, uh, or those kind of systems, because you don't want administrators to go in and log in into the system and actually uh, um, make, make the system dirty, or they could inadvertently uh, make, make uh, issues there. And uh, any time uh, a system is uh, touched, it needs to get uh, redeployed, and uh, the whole pipeline uh, is built. So uh, in, uh, for the infrastructure uh, buildup, uh, what they used was uh, everything was checked in into the Git. From the Git, uh, the manifest uh, information was pushed into console, which is key value data store. And from the console, different parts of the deployment would pick up the information. So for example, Jenkins would pick up what, what is the manifest file and how to build the uh, the application image, whether it's Linux or yeah, Windows, and then from there, uh, it would actually uh, push uh, the packages on top of it and then run the services. So all this is uh, kind of information is in one single place, and information, that, that single place is triggered off uh, and GitHub. Um, so, so uh, in order to, now, now that the image is kind of built and it is uh, um, always the environment is set up properly and predictably, the next thing is whenever changes need to be done, they, it always goes through the pipeline. And the pipeline starts at Git and 
you have kind of follows through the different stages uh, orchestrated by Jenkins. Uh, so everything from system patches, operating system upgrades, uh, yeah, uh, agent or configuration updates, everything goes through this pipeline. And having a blue-green makes it really, really uh, easy for them to uh, do complex upgrades like like uh, in, like like a, a operating system upgrade, where they can uh, everything being the same, the client traffic is coming in uh, to the load balancer, AVI load balancer, and then they are able to bring in completely new version and be able to test it without uh, losing their existing environment or tainting it. Um, this is an example pipeline uh, of the top one shows how the success looks like, where it will keep go hitting every stage. Uh, promotion happens to the next stage. Validation, deploy, promotion, it kind of keeps repeating. And when there is a failure, uh, they, they are able to detect failure most of the time, even before the code makes it into the production. Hmm? Okay. Uh, so uh, this is uh, like a quick run, run through the, their, their pipeline. So uh, as I talked about the uh, building of the image itself, that was actually done with the Ansible tooling. Uh, so it would check out the right packages, build it, and once it is built, it would uh, kick off to Jenkins. Jenkins uh, was set up with the Blue Ocean pipeline, and uh, uh, all the artifacts are stored in the JFrog artifactory, and uh, that, then Jenkins would kick, it, kick the application deployment. Um, the application itself, once it is kind of built, unit tests are done, uh, a heat stack is created uh, in OpenStack. So the heat stack translates to a pool in AVI, and then the pool becomes part of the pool group in uh, in Avi uh, environment, and uh, then like, like we saw the demo, the the automatic blue green is triggered using the ratio changes. Um, but before before the the ratios are updated, once it is part of the pool, Avi does the health checking and all the validations uh, on that version of the applications is done even before that live traffic is switched uh, to it. And, and that uh, with, with the content rules and with the policies available in a load balancer, uh, these kind of operations are very easy to do. Uh, so once um, uh, kind of the, uh, the live traffic, uh, uh, the, the new pool comes in, in the bottom you see the priority two. Uh, this is actually the, the, the pool which is in service, and the first one uh, gets the test traffic, everything goes fine. Uh, uh, it, is, um, it is taken out, but if there are any failures, the, the beauty of the deployment is the, the previous um, system is all intact and ready to go and uh, take over the rollback. So recovery becomes very, very nice uh, in this kind of environment. And um, uh, in the cannery, again, from 90-10, they start and they go to 50-50 uh, uh, and then 200. And uh, finally, uh, kind of the other pool uh, is still there. It is still available, but it's just not receiving any live traffic. And if somebody wants to go do triaging, go look at the logs or kind of harness uh, uh, assets from it, they can, they can do it as well. Um, so with that, uh, kind of lessons learned. Uh, one, uh, testing is extremely important, which is kind of obvious. Uh, do not underestimate the cultural change required. A lot of times, uh, the te technology and the tooling is there. In fact, we believe with, with uh, this kind of a simple API change, you are able to do traffic, live traffic distribution. Anyone can do blue-green now with, with this. I mean, we, we have been able to show the blue-green with so many different kinds of apps. but it, it, it that, but. For many uh, cultures, it may be too much of a, a automation or too much of a cultural shift to not having to babysit uh, the whole whole deployment. Um, again, uh, do not uh, start out trying to automate manual process. I think it is better to start from uh, a wall garden approach where everything is automated and then bring in your applications into it. And um, buying from all levels of our organization is very critical. Uh, this problem cannot be solved in silo. There is always going to be multiple, uh, 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 multiple parts in, in any enterprise. And uh, also, 
uh, kind of, the, the, even though we, we, we kind of talk in terms of blue-green, but re in reality or in practice, blue-green means nothing. Uh, version one, version two are, are the things most people use, and uh, you can come up with your own nomenclature. Uh, with that, uh, uh, thanks everyone, and if there are questions, uh, uh, we'll be happy to take it.